pardon me. Um, but I believe Acts is your favorite book of the Bible, or one of them. So, on your mark, get set, go. Uh, let me make sure that I'm being heard. Uh, you folks in Zoom land, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Um, have on the e news that we get uh, every week on our email, or at least it's either the e news or the uh, Duke Chapel thing I get every week, uh, there is a link to the lectionary text of that week for that coming Sunday. Uh, I'm afraid to ask, I'll ask it rhetorically, how many people read those lectionary texts before church on Sunday? Well, like I said, it was rhetorical. <laughs> and uh, if you do, <clears throat> Sometimes there will be, and it's more often with the Psalms than with any other uh, book of the Bible, it will give you a chapter, say Psalm 72, and it might say verses 1 through 4 and 10 through 14. Now, I'm um, something of a biblical scholar, sort of low-end biblical scholar, but that's what my PhD is in. But biblical scholars love to read detective stories. They think, they think that we're a little bit like detectives. So if I'm encountering a uh, lectionary reading that says verses 1 through 4 and verses 10 through 14, what's my first question? What were the others? What's missing? What is missing? And so I always read what is missing. And more often than not, I find that it's something not good. Uh, and that's why they left it out. I will compliment the, uh, our hymnal, uh, which is the United Methodist hymnal with our covers put on it, uh, that in its Psalter, it doesn't do that. It gives you the whole thing, the good and the bad. And this lesson today is going to be something of the whole thing, the good and the bad. Uh, there is bad stuff in the Bible, not an overwhelming amount, but um, there's enough bad stuff. I'm just, for an example, going to read you a bad story in the Bible. Uh, this is from 2 Kings. Uh, verses the uh, chapter two, verses 23 through the end of the chapter. Uh, it's about Elisha. Elisha went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go away, bald head! Go away, bald head! When he turned around and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel and returned to Samaria. Now, that did, have you read that story? But How many of you have read that story before? Uh, a couple of you, okay, good, uh, good Bible readers. I, that story just doesn't 
feel right to me. I'm good cursing in the name of the Lord. And then is it the Lord who sends, doesn't say explicitly, is it the Lord who sends out the two she bears to maul the uh, 42 boys? That's, that's terrible. I've, I'm guessing that Phyllis is not going to tell that story in We Praise. Um, <laughs> there, hmm. Well, we also, many of us, sort of get the idea, and eh, that story, Second Kings, that's Old Testament. Old Testament. God's that way in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, God is good all the time. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, the love of Jesus prevails, and the New Testament needs to be our understanding of God and of the Bible. Uh, have you read Revelation? Um the bad stuff can happen in the New Testament too. Certainly, I think it's true that one gets a feeling more of the fear of God, also the justice of God. Sometimes it seems, as in the case I just read, like the injustice of God in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, everything works out. Uh, I, I wrote a book called Jesus and the Pleasures. And my one good sentence, I'm not sure I believe it now, but yeah, maybe I do. Uh, my one really good sentence was Jesus softened the heart of God. Um, that, yes, yeah, you can think that's probably one of the early heresies or another. You can hardly say anything about Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, Trinity without falling into one or another early church heresies. But it seems to me that God and God through Jesus in the New Testament is softer, a loving and forgiving God. Now I'm saying that, I better say too, that with the New Testament as well as the old, we need to take the good with the bad, or the bad with the good. Uh, so the first story we got, we're going to see, and Nelson, can you put it up there on the screen? Uh, uh, this first story is from Acts 5, um, and there we go. Oh, let's see. And uh, I don't know who all is on, on Zoom today. Um, anybody on Zoom want to read that for us? Oh. That's funny, too. Uh, how, about, how about Dean? Dean, could you read it for us? And I think you're muted. There we go. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, 
were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard of it. The young man came, young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. Well, thank you, Dean. Um, hmm, this is in the New Testament. Um, I'm, what do I do the text like this? How do I feel about it? Well, I can wonder first, how did the early Christians understand this, what they read? And maybe how would people from the more conservative uh, churches from what we are, how would they understand it? They might understand it is, yeah, Ananias and Sapphira got what they deserved. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Can't do much worse than that. Boom, strike them dead. I'm not comfortable with that view of the text. I do have questions, several questions about the text. Uh, I mean, we could first ask the historical question. Did this actually happen? Um, it's one of those things, uh, sort of the harder text is more often original in text criticism. There's uh, this, if there weren't something going like this actually happening, uh, there wouldn't be a whole lot of reason for Luke, who is one of the most, who is the most kind-hearted of the gospel writers, and he is the writer of Acts. There wouldn't be reason for him to make up a bad story. I'm calling it a bad story, and um, put it in there. So it's there. It's part of the Bible. Um, how that story? And I need you to talk. And now uh, people on Zoom or what? What? How do you feel about it? What are we going to do with that story? Well, one thing, Christian, in Luke's gospel, I think Luke, much more than the other three, um, condemns the love of money. You think of the, the story of the rich young ruler and the, uh, the woe, the beatitudes with the woes about the wealthy people. And so kind of theme-wise, it almost sort of does fit in a little bit with Luke's gospel, much more than maybe some of the others. But like you said, it's, it's still kind of troubling and seems kind of rough. Yeah. Matthew and Mark do have the uh, story of the rich um, ruler, Jesus says, go. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I think I would agree uh, with Dean's assessment. Leslie, somebody, Bo Bodie, what's... Well, what it the, it, he lied to men. He truly lied to the Holy Spirit. I mean, I... And his wife certainly lied, but did he come to them truly promising 
that he was going to bring the entire amount. He he lied to the to the apostles. Uh, but was he was he really forthright in his heart to the Holy Spirit? I that's my question. Is that a question we can answer? No, not really. No. Uh, hmm. But it seems to me the price to lying to men, as opposed to lying to the Holy Spirit, are two separate things. Yes. I, let, let me repeat that here uh, for Zoom people. Uh, but are you saying that lying to the Holy, did he really lie to the Holy, Holy Spirit? Lying to the Holy Spirit is different than lying to men. And uh, here he's uh, keeping back. Uh, some of proceeds of the of the this land sale, uh, Harry. I think talking about that presupposes that their death was done to them, and it. I don't know that it was done to them, but something that they brought on themselves in their reaction to the fact that they had been shown unfaithful untrustworthy uh harry harry's saying that the death um we don't hear that god kills them in this text um they you know how did they die uh perhaps for ananias it's a stroke uh, for a heart attack, perhaps for Sapphira, it's a stroke. It doesn't say God killed them. They weren't, nobody curses them in the name of the Lord. Maybe they just, when confronted with uh, their own dishonesty, they... Uh, of strokes die. Uh, that's a good that that gets God off the hook. Uh, and um, and I think it's a very logical interpretation of the text. But I I've got other I mean there are other things too that are a little bit bothering. They kept they owned this land. Uh, they sold it. They kept some of it for themselves, but they gave a good portion to the church, to the fledgling church. Were they really that bad? The question then becomes, did they intend to draw from the common money? If they uh, weren't going to draw from the common money, it seems reasonable that they should keep back a portion to take care of themselves. Here, yes, we don't have all this. We're, we'll take care of ourselves with this. Harry's saying if they are going to draw from the common money, once it's in there, uh, then it's uh, not good. If they're going not to draw from this common money, then it is a gift and it is good. And again, that's a question that the text does not answer. Uh, so yes, Jack. We don't really know what happens before the scene opens, what sort of commitment may or may not have been made. But if we want to generalize from this and step back a bit, we can say that faith commitments and faith choices are consequential. Yeah, Jack said, says we don't really know uh, the background of this, what happened before this. Uh, if they have made a faith commitment, faith commitments have consequences. Uh, thank you for reminding me of that, Jack. Uh, Marianne and I are a little behind on our pledge, but <laughs> we will... We, oh, and now I'm going to have a stroke. Uh, we, but we're, I've got to check right there. We're, we're, we're catching up. We'll, 
we'll get there. We'll be there by the end of December. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Christian. Christian. This is Bush say again, friend. It's not also an issue that they lied. It seems like yeah. if they had sell, we sold our property and we're keeping 20% for ourselves and giving you the rest or 80% or whatever, it's filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Not that they didn't give them the money, but that they lied. I, I think that's correct that they're, uh, that she said it wasn't that they didn't give all the money, it was that they lied about it. Um, and that um, that is, I think, an accurate reading of the text, but still seems like if God is in this, if God is involved in their dying, I'm still uncomfortable with that. So how should I go ahead and help me, people? Bunny has something to say. Oh, let's see. And yeah, it's okay, Bunny. Well, um, can, can you hear me? Yes, right. I can hear you. Okay, I'll good. Okay. Yes. My point was really just, <laughs> yeah, I'm yelling really loud. You can hear me from me. Um, my point was going to be the same, was the issue here, whether they sold the property, all of it, or whether they lied to the Holy Spirit, was this the being caught in the lie to the Holy Spirit being such a heinous act to, to lie to, the, to God. Uh, yeah. And, um, and I, I, you know, we, like you're saying, we don't know what the background is here. We just have this little piece. Um, well, I think that's right, that it seems to be that lying to God, uh, lying to the Holy Spirit uh, was how, how do I, let's see, somebody else had to come, oh, Let yes. Me, right, I wanted to just add one other piece in the mix here. Back in, in the, a few verses before this chapter, in chapter four, beginning at verse 32, it says, now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions but everything they owned was held in common. So I wonder if we're talking about background, do we throw that in the mix as we're trying to figure out what might have happened or how- Yeah, they yeah so let's throw it in the mix. Okay. That everything was, uh, that the church had decided beforehand, the church in Jerusalem, let me specify, had decided beforehand that they would uh, hold everything in common. Uh, that whatever property, whatever money they had would be held in common. Uh, <clears throat> it would be distributed uh, by the apostles in chapter six. Uh, Will last week went over the, uh, some controversy in chapter six about who would, uh, uh, about daily distribution to widows and one group of widows being uh, uh, feeling like they were being uh, not adequately taken care of. But that's the, uh, the whole situation in the Jerusalem church. They very early on decided to hold things in common. Uh, this communism um, seems to have been just the Jerusalem church. Um, as the church spreads out to more and more cities, one of the things we find, and uh, I don't really want to get into uh, well, I can get into first century politics, I guess. I don't want to get into 21st century politics at the moment. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, oh, 
Frederick Engels, Karl Marx's uh, uh, fellow worker writer, uh, wrote a whole pamphlet on how the early Christians were communists, and this uh, he used this text. Uh, I'll speak from. I'm, my politics are sort of wanting a well-regulated capitalism. What happened, one of the things that happens, and you see it uh, in the Corinthian letters and a couple other places in the New Testament, Paul is every practically every church he's founding, he asked for contributions to go to the Jerusalem church. Uh, the Jerusalem church is poor. Now, a capitalist reading of this text showed, well, uh, Frederick Engels, here's what happens when you hold it. Yeah, everybody goes poor. Uh, that's really a whole, a whole nother issue. I guess, but that's um, uh, was this early Christian practice, and it's I don't if I can get back to uh, lying to the Holy Spirit. I'm still thinking. Well, two questions. One is this a punishment? their deaths, or is this a natural occurrence? Maybe I should uh, take a show of hands. Jack. Very good mind that question, and Lynn's continent. One of the drivers to that determination ought to be the third sentence in the second paragraph. How is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? He did, he, Jack is asking us to look at that second paragraph, third sentence. Uh, how is it that we, you're putting the spirit of the Lord to the test? Uh, we don't know what's in Ananias's mind. We don't know what's in Sapphira's mind. If they're really putting the Lord to the test, maybe they are, but is that what's in their minds? Hmm. Well, I think the entire passage presupposes that they did make a commitment to the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, I mean, the, the logical conclusion is the Holy Spirit struck them down. But I would go so far as to say anyone that truly understands an omnipotent, omnipresent, all-knowing God, is it possible to lie? To someone that that knows everything, it's not possible. So, I, I mean, we're we're creating a circular argument that's impossible to solve. I think you're right. Buddy says, "Where uh, uh, is it possible to lie to an all-knowing God? God knows all anyway." And uh, are we getting into a circular argument? And I'm getting to feel that way. Yes. <laughs> You know, someone we learned a lot about in the story of Peter, uh, Peter who seems to be able to do no wrong acts, you know, this guy dies at his feet, and then his wife comes in a little bit later, and Peter is not like, hey, um, like your wife died, and I'm going to help you through this. He's like, he, he, he kind of mean um, about it, and I think he feels like he can do no wrong. He doesn't seem to have any remorse about what's happening here. Um, yet it feels like later on in Acts, Perhaps from Peter's leadership starts to show. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I don't know if I can quite repeat all that, but yes. Uh, Peter's not looking good. <laughs> uh, no, he's, he's not. Uh, and maybe that's one of the things about the Bible that if you read any other ancient literature, uh, if you read Egyptian literature from the same period, uh, if you read Greek literature from the same period, the heroes do no wrong. 
if you read um, about Ramses II, it doesn't tell you he is likely the pharaoh of the Exodus time. Uh, if you read from the Egyptian annals about uh, Ramses II, he ruled for 66 years and did no wrong. He was a great warrior. He was great for his people. He's, the Bible is such a contrast. The Bible so much tells it like it is. Uh, the good and the bad. Uh, David, ooh, lots of bad <laughs> stories. Uh, and he was the great king. Um, uh, well, we've, I think we have maybe fairly adequately examined this text in Acts 5 and We've solved all the problems in it, right? Uh, let's go on to another one uh, in a little further in Acts. And if you could, uh, Nelson, if you could flip up the next one. Uh, here we go, Acts 5, 33 through 38. And uh, let's see, buddy, could you read that for us? Can you see it? <laughs> I think you may be. Here we go. Yeah, let me get unmuted. And my printer's printing the bulletin for 11 o'clock. So give it just a second. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. How when they this? heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Galileo, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the man to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because of this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. Okay, thank you, buddy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, well, let me say a couple of things about Gamaliel. Uh, Gamaliel, this is Gamaliel, Gamaliel the first. He, uh, in what became the whole rabbinic movement in Judaism, uh, he was a major leader. Uh, he, we read about him in other, uh, in Jewish text of that period and, and later. He was what, the first uh, rabbi to get the title Rabban, which is a very honorary title. He was grandson of probably the greatest rabbi of the first century, Hillel. And uh, if you know, in on campuses, Jewish found Jewish. Uh, groups, and I think it's the case here at Duke, it's, uh, uh, the, the Jewish campus organization is called Hillel after uh, uh, that great rabbi. I have even thought Hillel, sometimes his sayings just sound a lot like Jesus. He, was, he came before they, their lives overlapped. But uh, like Halel said, do not do, do not do things to other people that you would not want them to do to you. In other words, he said, uh, Jesus put it all positively. He said the same thing negatively. Well, this is his grandson, one of the great rabbis, and also Paul's teacher. Um, 
Paul um, was a Jew. Paul, when I say was, maybe I, Paul understood himself as being a Jew his entire life. He became a Jew who believed in Christ, but he was not, and he was not only a Jew, he was a Pharisee who had studied under the, uh, probably the, one of the greatest Pharisaic rabbis uh, with his study under uh, Gamaliel. Um, my, I have a, one of my old professors at Duke, uh, W.D. Davies, wrote a, uh, and incidentally, his daughter is a member of our congregation, uh, W.D. Davies wrote a book called Paul and Rabbinic Judaism, in which he takes things of the rabbis, thoughts of the rabbis of this period, and shows how they are background for a lot of Paul's thinking. Uh, Paul's thinking is very, uh, very Jewish in many respects. And it is uh, that strong background, I think, and that, you know, if you get a strong background growing up, you can, it's going to affect you, even if you change. Uh, in my years of being a United Methodist parish minister, if I got someone who would come to my office uh, and want to become a member of my church, they, in interviewing them for about 10 minutes, I could pretty often, if they were a Baptist, I could tell. Uh, a lot of times, if, uh, if they were Lutherans or Presbyterians or Methodists, I could usually tell there is language that is uh, used. I thought, for example, I've got um, in the, the uh, Wednesday book group that I'm in uh, that uh, Carol leads, uh, we have a young woman who will fairly frequently refer to mm, things like, this is the law, this is the gospel. What denomination is that? Lutheran. Lutherans think in those terms, and it all goes back to, uh, to Martin Luther. Or I could run into somebody like Carol, who, oh, uh, I don't think I'd known her for more than half an hour before she mentioned the sovereignty of God. Uh, that's a real Presbyterian phrase. Things will, uh, Yeah, Jack, Fran, do you ever talk about the sovereignty of God? Uh, no, you're a Methodist We got all, we got all, it's a fun thing. We got all kinds of uh, people in this church, and maybe I could do a game sometime. Maybe Carol and I could be con contestants and try to find who could find out quickly what sort of denomination you, uh, you came from. Well, in any case, Paul was a Pharisaic Jew, and his Pharisaism, what he learned, he learned from Gamaliel I. And here we have this scene of Gamaliel, and there's several things that we need uh, 
that we should note about this. You've got uh, Jews in Jerusalem who are coming to the rabbis about this new group. These, they haven't even started calling them Christians yet. These apostle people and the people who are following them. There are troubling things about them. Uh, they, there are things they are saying about this guy, uh, Jesus, who was a criminal, who was a revolutionary, who tried to overthrow the Roman government, who, uh, and therefore uh, Pontius Pilate caught him and, and had him put to death. They're saying things about this Jesus that he is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. That's, you know, and the thing about it is some people are believing it. The Messiah is a descendant of David who will restore the kingdom to Israel, who will eliminate Roman rule. We've had some guys who made that claim. Uh, Thutis, chapter, uh, verse 36, uh, claim to be something, uh, but his movement didn't make it. Uh, Judas the Galilean, which is different from Judas the betraying apostle, um, also perished. People were following him. So Gamaliel's counsel and Wise counsel, I think it is. You know, if this movement is bad, it will probably dissolve on itself, just like the movements of Judas and Judas the Gal Galilean. Uh, if this movement is has something going for it. Let's just let's just not bother it for the moment. And uh, this is another scene I think that is likely quite uh, pretty historically accurate. That uh, Paul did in fact study under Gamaliel. Paul has not appeared on the scene yet. He will in the next chapter. Uh, and that. Uh, you know, just let things go. They will work themselves out one way or another. Uh, wise counsel, and indeed, uh, it did work out for the Christians. It took a long time. Uh, it took much opposition. And I would say uh, Gamaliel is going to be something of the exception here. Um, as we go through, through Acts, we're going to find uh, more often the case that <coughs> Jews, Jewish authorities will try to stop this Christian movement. And one of the first Jews to try to stop this Christian movement was Paul. Paul, who will have an uh, amazing turnaround experience in Acts uh, chapter 9. Uh, so sometimes that's good advice for us. Sometimes we just need to let things work themselves out. Uh, and any other thoughts or questions on this text?
there a reason that you left out verse 39? Yeah, read it to us, friend. But if it is a God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. This was probably my fault for not uh, giving Nelson the right verses. Yeah, let, let me read uh, verse 39 uh, to everybody. Uh, let's see. If this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow it, overthrow them. In that case, you may be found fighting against God. Uh, you know, we can run across, we can deal for a moment with the problem of Luke and his sources. Do you think Gamaliel would say all of that? Well, yeah, maybe. Sometimes Luke um, Luke has Jerusalem sources. Uh, the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, he tells about he tells his historical method that he's talked to eyewitnesses, that he's uh, used narratives that were written before him. And um, uh, my my apologies for not getting verse uh, thirty eight and 30, verse 39 up there. Okay. Uh, uh, anything else on this text? Okay, we're going to go on and look at one more, and that's the speech of Stephen. Uh, and this one is fairly long. Um, uh, I'm going to, well, I think I'm just going to uh, summarize it. The Stephen is, if you remember uh, last week, Will talked about the appointment of uh, seven people to take care of the matter of the daily distribution of the goods they had, food distribution. Uh, to those who were widowed. Uh, Stephen was one of those who was chosen to do this. Uh, one thing noteworthy, uh, the apostles were all Palestinian Jews. The seven uh, who were uh, appointed to take care of this were uh, all had Greek names. And so that probably assured a more even distribution of uh, the food. Let's see. Uh, okay, that's sort of the end of the story. I want to talk about, a little bit about Stephen's speech. At this point, um, you have the, the high priest of the uh, Jerusalem Jews at this point is going to uh, examine Stephen, find him guilty, and uh, he will be sentenced to be stoned. Should make a little, make it clear about priests and rabbis. Priests and rabbis are two different things, uh, quite different things. The priests are, they control the temple. They take care of the sacrifices. Sacrifice is, that's the main thing they do. People from all over the Mediterranean world and certainly people bring um, come to Jerusalem by usually birds to be sacrificed for them and for their uh, families. And they uh, have regular courses of sacrifice every day, animal sacrifice. 
Uh, Christianity, incidentally, will be the first religion that does not practice animal sacrifice. Um, so they, uh, the priest controlled the temple. They controlled a tremendous amount of land. They are uh, within the political framework of Palestinian Judaism. They are the uh, wealthy landowners. They are among the various religious political groups, Pharisees, Essenes, Zealots. The priests are fine with Roman rule. They cooperate with the Romans. The Romans control the land uh, and they allow the priests to have a good deal of authority within uh, that, that structure. The Pharisees and the, uh, are not, the Pharisees are laymen. They are not, uh, they are not all that well organized as the priest. Uh, they are, the title is rabbi, they are teachers. Whereas the major concern of the priest is the carrying out of the sacrifices. The major uh, concern of the rabbis is studying the Torah, studying and doing the first five, well, all the things that we are told to do in the first five books of the, of the Bible, particularly uh, the last, uh, well, Leviticus, the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, 613 laws in there carry out those 613 laws. Uh, so they, and if you notice when you're reading the Gospels, when Jesus is having a controversy with uh, Pharisees, it's almost always a controversy over biblical interpretation. The priest, uh, the rabbis are dedicated to the Bible. Stephen is, it's the priest who are having him stoned. Uh, whether technically this is not legal for them to do, technically in this uh, territory, which is administered, run by Romans, only the Romans could execute capital punishment, but the Romans, they don't, you know, priests cooperate with them, priests pay their taxes. We'll let the priests do what they want to do in this manner instance of uh, this Christian who has been preaching too much. Stephen will make a speech and <clears throat> in chapter seven, uh, I'm not going to read it. It's the longest speech in Acts, longer than any of Peter's and or Paul's. And it's interesting. Uh, read it. Read it for yourselves. Stephen sort of gives a summary of the Old Testament. He starts with Abraham. He gets. Uh, he gets all the way through David, tells a lot of stories. Then he feels, I get the sense that um, your time's about up, Stephen. Uh, again, and so the summary gets a, a lot briefer of the latter parts of the Old Testament. And the point at the end is Stephen is saying that Jesus is the culmination of all the Old Testament. Jesus is, uh, well, as Paul would say, Jesus is the end of the end, the ultimate goal that the law, the Torah, was leading us to. And that 
we, Stephen and the others, we now take understand the Torah in a different dimension. It is, uh, it is in our past, we revere it, but, and we understand ourselves as the descendants of all of these uh, Old Testament figures. The descendants, yes, but the, perhaps the better way to say it is the culmination. A lot of times we can ask ourselves, what do we do? Do you ever ask yourself this? What do we do with the Old Testament? Um, yeah, it's, we keep it. There were early Christians, a named Marcion, who said, the Old Testament's Jewish book, New Testament's Christian book, throw out the Old Testament. It didn't go. Uh, we keep it. It is a part of us. And maybe this is a question about how to understand. Yes. Is it more that we're, as Christians, guided by Jesus? Not that we don't respect our history, but we're guided by grace. Yes. Uh, we respect our history, but we are guided by Jesus, and by the grace that is, uh, that is in Jesus. And that was uh, what Stephen was guided by. We have uh, here, well, you, know, you know the story of the stoning of Sidney. He was stoned to death. And before he dies, he uh, looks up into heaven and he, uh, he says, uh, while they're stoning him, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Uh, when, oh, I'm going to look up a couple of, yeah, a couple of verses earlier, verse 56. I see Stephen has a vision while he's being stoned. And he says, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Uh, this is the only place outside the Gospels where Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. In the Gospel of Jesus, he gives that as uh, self-reference often. So in, he is, Stephen is ready to die for his faith, and his faith, as he is dying, he sees Jesus, uh, and Christianity will move on. Thanks be to God, and thanks to you all and you all on Zoom. Uh, let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the apostles, for Stephen for his willingness to die for faith in Jesus. Lord, as we study Acts, give us more of that faith through your grace. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, people. Good to, good to see all of you. We, we seem to be growing in attendance so uh and thanks to everybody on zoom and for nelson we don't want to